In June of 1506, after an absence of six years, Leonardo returned to Milan. Once forced to flee from the advancing French army, he had left behind 20 years of development, triumph, and failure. Now he was curious to see how much of himself and of his past remained. Can we come with you, maestro? No, wait here. I'll be back in a moment. His first stop was the monastery of Santa Maria della Grazia. Although the French regent was waiting to receive him, his only thought was the cold, clammy refectory where he had spent so many hours and the silent mark he had left of his presence. No, you're taking too many liberties now. Who said you could sit on the table? Go on, get off, get off, get away. Father Agostino, could you help me? Watch over that table. It's almost impossible to think here, much less to eat. Nobody ate here at all for two years. Imagine all that time. They closed off the room just so that could be painted. Now these students come here trying to copy that thing. They think we're running a school. I say this room is a place to eat. You go to school elsewhere. It's foolishness. That picture's a disaster. It's brought us nothing but a lot of trouble. I told them to cut a hole in it and make a door right to the kitchen. Now, there's a lover of great art. Cut a hole in it and make a door. Yes, a door, because in the winter, the food comes in half cold. And the prior says, be patient. They should go Have we school. met? <laughs> Julio, isn't that the maestro himself? What happened at Santa Maria della Grazia also took place in the church of San Francesco Grande where other students collected around his Virgin of the Rocks. Never before had paintings been so carefully studied and copied. During his absence, the two works Leonardo had left behind had become the very essence of painting. Maestro. The Maestro. Upon his arrival in Milan, he was to discover that the French, once his enemies, regarded him as a master artist, whereas back in Florence, he was in debt to Pierre Soderini for a painting he would never finish. The French regent of Milan was eager to return the duchy to the golden age of art it had once known under Lodovico the Moor, and to him, that meant only one thing, the permanent return of Leonardo. Maestro Leonardo. Charles d'Amboise was a great warrior and a great lover of art. Young and of refined tastes, he was drawn to all that was beautiful, beautiful women and beautiful objects. Oh, no, 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 no. On behalf of His Majesty, let me say what a great pleasure it is to welcome you back to Milan, Maestro Leonardo. You've been away too long, much too long. He welcomed Leonardo as he would a prince, believing that the great artist had returned to Milan for good. I'm very sorry I can't accommodate you. I mustn't remain in Milan more than three months. Only three months. Then I must return to Florence. I'm contracted to the Signoria and uh, the standard bearer, Pierre Soderini. That matter can be handled. You mustn't worry about it. His Majesty can't permit you to leave here again. 
I heard him say when he first saw the Last Supper in the Grazia, he wished he could remove the wall and take it to France. He did send engineers, <laughs> but they found the job too difficult. <laughs> His Majesty, in any case, is hopeful you remain here. Camboise was true to his word. With the help of King Louis XII, he had Leonardo freed from his bond to Florence. Leonardo's second stay in Milan was probably his first and only period of inner peace in a life filled with conflict and suffering. He secured a small house near Babila, but most of his time was spent in the home of Girolamo Melzi, captain of the Milanese militia, and with the captain's young son, Francesco Melzi. Listen, maestro, somebody's shooting. I wonder if it's Salai. Francesco Melzi was only 17 then, but Giorgio Vasari knew him as an old man and tells us this about him in his biography of Leonardo. Francesco Melzi was a handsome young art student when Leonardo met and befriended him on his return to Lombardy. At this time, he is an old man, yet still very handsome. You two take the path to the right. Proud and talented, open and generous, he soon became Leonardo's most ardent admirer and closest companion. Francesco was of noble family and the complete opposite of the capricious, insolent Salai. Leonardo, who had known so little of human companionship, was suddenly given the truest friend he would ever have. There! There it is! Sounds as though he shot a bird. I'll get it! I think I hit it in the wing! Maestro! Over here! Hold on! We're coming! This way! Over this way! Here, give it to me. <laughs> the water's cold. <laughs> Thirsty? <laughs> oh. I'm in before you tip us over. <laughs> While he was a guest of the Melzi family, Leonardo was commissioned by Charles d'Amboise to design a canal linking Milan and a nearby lake. Hey, anyone around? <laughs> Here. Although the canal was never built, in the course of his planning, Leonardo invented a system of locks to overcome the problem of different water levels. 400 years later, the same system was used by the engineers who built the Panama Canal. Maestro, your notes, are they in Arabic? Arabic? I can't read what you've written. You know, I've never explained my writing to anybody. And if I do, I trust you'll keep it completely between us. Can you make this out? No, I can't. How about now? Oh, I see. It's printed backwards. You mean that's all there is to it? Shh. Life at his own house at Babila gave him the serenity to assemble and reflect on his voluminous notes. The drawing, Francesco. The drawing. Yes, my they contained his years of research and would ultimately be left to his beloved friend. Uh, Maestro, where shall I put these? Over there, Andrea. Get me that drawing over there on the table, uh, near those notes on anatomy. Is this the one, Maestro? No, put it down. Francesco. Leonardo's notes, which were later scattered and lost by Melzi's heirs, contained several dissertations yes. intended for publication someday. The treatise on painting, the book of mechanics, the treatise on water, and above all, his book on anatomy, for which he had prepared 140 diagrams. Uh, where did I put them? Francesco. Yes, maestro. Those papers I was looking at yesterday, do you remember where I put them? Oh, I'll get them. Francesco, Francesco. Francesco, come here and help me. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I, I can't seem to find a thing. Francesco, Francesco. Picture in my next fresco. Hey, somebody chasing you? Better come here and help me find it. We'll find it. Francesco. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, 
Majesty. In the spring of 1507, Louis XII of France entered Milan and immediately went to Leonardo's studio. For a king, it was an unheard of gesture of respect. Your Majesty. Ah, there you are. Our beloved friend, Maestro da Vinci. My dear Maestro, this is a great honor. We are indeed happy that the Signoria of Florence has given her gracious permission for you to remain with us. It is a joy for us to be here in your studio. Such magnificent paintings. Tamboise, look at this one. It's the it's king, Louis. it's Louis. It is magnificent. It's mainly the work of my apprentice, sire. Of course, there's still more to be done. It looks finished to me. Oh, but this is incredible. You may demand your own price, but I must take it to France. I'm glad that it's painted on wood. His last supper is painted on the wall. Unfortunately, it's not quite finished, Majesty. You mean there's something missing? I'm afraid so, sire. However, if your Majesty would like to see my plans for the new canal. Uh, let's have a look at this canal. It's sure to be worthy of you. Don was. That confiscated vineyard? Maestro Leonardo is in possession of his vineyard again. Ah. To demonstrate our great admiration for your work, we've decided to provide you with 12 ounces of water. Did, Did you hear 12, 12 ounces, ounces of water? Droughts and inaccessibility caused great water shortages in Milan. As Leonardo's canal was meant to alleviate them, the king gave him a share of the dues the citizenry would have to pay for use of the river. It was an age when drinking water had grown almost as valuable as gold, and this revenue would prove great. And so would the revenue from the vineyard that Lodovico the Moor had given Leonardo when he was ruler. For Leonardo, like many artists, hoping for a little security, dreamed of being a landowner, as he dreamed of having a certain house of his own, the one in which he was born and lived in as a child. There'd come a time when he'd receive it through the will of his uncle Francesco. But was the house at Vinci to be his? Around this time, his uncle Francesco died. He had been closer to Leonardo than his father or mother. He hadn't been in Milan for very long when he received a report that the old man had left him everything he had. There were no other heirs because all of Leonardo's brothers and sisters were left out of the will. All of you, all of you despise Uncle Francesco. You never even want to visit him or me either. Who do you hate most, Francesco or me? Answer that. I guess it's only me now. Since he's dead, you can only hate me. Have you ever thought of writing a letter to your brother? No. Except, of course, when our father died, because he left me some money, and because you wanted to have it all. Now you are Francesco. For years, the old man had been left to fend for himself at Vinci, just a short distance from Florence, where his nephews lived. Only Leonardo, on his journeys from city to city, stopped to visit him. But now that Francesco was gone, these sly provincials suddenly remembered his small property and went to court to nullify his will. Because the designated heir, their great and famous brother, was still illegitimate. Well, the problem is quite simple, actually. And they will obey my letter. To the standard bearer of Florence, Pier Soderini, we are sending to you Maestro Leonardo da Vinci, painter to His Gracious Majesty Louis XII, who has our permission to travel to Florence to pursue a certain personal matter concerning a house at Vinci, which was left him in a binding will stating his late uncle's true wishes. Let us be sure that you completely understand our position in this matter. We urge, indeed we strongly urge Your Excellency to give him all possible aid and to see that his case is heard swiftly. The King expects that the Maestro not be detained, but that he shall return as soon as possible. Well, that's my letter to Soderini. Here's another. To our gracious ally and brother, our dear friend and confidant, the perpetual authority of Florence. When His Majesty heard you were about to go, he felt compelled to write his own letter to make sure you were given support. Well, when you present these letters to Soderini, I'm sure you will come back satisfied in a matter of days. God. But it was not a matter of days. In fact, weeks passed and the case was never brought to trial. The letters from the King of France and his marshal had brought Leonardo nothing more than polite but empty promises. Maestro, the governor regrets he is in council and cannot receive you now. He asks that you wait.
And so he waited. But as the days passed, still there was no word of the hearing. Maestro, the governor regrets that he still cannot receive you, but he suggests that you petition for the proceedings yourself, and he will give you every possible aid when his time allows. He spent the entire winter in Florence, persisting in his attempts to be heard. Since D'Amboise, his patron, could have provided him with ample funds, there can be no reason for his tireless pursuit of this small and relatively worthless property, except perhaps his desire to find justice. Excuse me. I've been all over the building, and the last office told me to come here to get this case settled once and for all. The defendant is Giuliano da Vinci, the notary. He's my brother, and I want to know if you... sorry, but I'm not the person you should ask about this. But that man over there told me I was supposed oh, to come it's here. It's the right place, but I'm sure he meant the other department on that side. Hmm. Perhaps those clerks can help you. Why not go and ask? brothers, and the workings of the law defeated him. As he had proved, Leonardo could adapt to any new ruler. However, he found it difficult to adjust to the workings of an ordinary bureaucracy. Some would have it that his frustrations with the pettiness in humanity finally made a cynic of him, as these might suggest. Leonardo had no great love for his fellow beings. He was not a saint like Francis of Assisi who loved them in spite of themselves. Nor was he a prophet like Savonarola, who loved them even as he damned them. Nor was he subject to the tempest of conflicting passions like Michelangelo, who both loved and hated his fellow men. Leonardo had difficulty loving others. He suffered when he observed the greediness, the indolence, and the arrogant conceit with which they displayed their ignorance. He said the intelligence given to human beings is a blessed gift, yet he further said, Many of our fellow men are not in fact even human. They are rather to be looked upon only as consumers of food and producers of excretion. The majority of them leave to the world after their death, a decayed body, no more. Suspicious, aristocratic, solitary. And yet that same man could write, I never tire of serving. I never tire of pleasing. Certainly one thing proven by Leonardo's work is that he wanted to please and serve. Let's take, for example, a few of his conceptions of urban planning that have come down to us. When contemporaries of his were commissioned to design new cities, they put in gigantic plazas, enormous statues and generally useless buildings. Leonardo was actually one of the first to consider roadways, drains and decentralization. He included canals to carry merchandise directly to the markets. On a higher level would be a network of roads for carts, carriages, and horses. Still higher, there would be a second network of roads for pedestrians. His drawings even incorporated some very modern designs for terraced housing. He designed his city to serve everyone. Even though this most important project could have revolutionized the very structure of Milan, it was totally abandoned. In March of 1511, Charles d'Amboise, the French regent of Milan, Leonardo's friend and patron, suddenly died. Soon after, one of those complex political wars that involved all the small states of Italy broke out again. In 1513, the French hastily abandoned Lombardy to the invading Swiss. 60 years old, Leonardo was again forced to flee. He was certain the new masters of Milan would deal harshly with those who had worked for the French. Maestro. We're all ready. This time, his travels would take him to Rome. Aside from Salai and his usual entourage, he was accompanied by a new apprentice, Francesco Melzi. No one knows if Francesco left any family at Vaprio other than his father. We only know he did not wish to be separated from Leonardo. On your own. You. Leonardo wrote, I left Milan on September 24th, 1513. With me were Francesco Melzi, Salai, Lorenzo, and Fanfoya. 
In Rome, Leonardo lived and worked in an apartment within the Vatican, which the young prince Giuliano de' Medici had prepared especially for him. Giuliano was the brother of Pope Leo X, and both were sons of Lorenzo the Magnificent, ruler of Florence when the maestro was a young man. There now began one of the most mysterious chapters in Leonardo's life. During his entire stay in Rome, his time was spent working on an apparatus that he sought to keep secret at all cost. We know it had to do with mirrors. Not only does Vasari mention that Leonardo was expecting mirrors in the Vatican, but it is also recorded that he asked for and was given two craftsmen to assist in his work, Germans who specialized in making mirrors. Maestro Leonardo. He's up there as usual. Yes. Maestro Leonardo. Well, now what is it? Before we go any further on this project, I must have a complete model in wood, showing every detail. It's absolutely impossible to know exactly what we're doing from the little you've told us. You know, in Germany, when we're working on something, we are always... Oh, that's not necessary. You'll make each little piece separately. But I don't like to work in this if fashion. If you accept the pay, then you work exactly as you're told. I'm not being paid by you. It's Medici's money. And I'll only take orders... Pay no mind to him, my When I... Well, you're right. That's enough. Uh, Let's go. Uh, who does he Maestro. think he is? I don't have to take that from him. Maestro, why do you permit such insolence? Francesco, patience is a protection against insult. As clothes protect you from the cold. Good morning, ladies. Ladies, I've got mirrors here. What's I going on out there? Innocent. You two, you two gentlemen. Over here. Ladies aren't the only ones... It's locked. Why has he locked it? You just pick out the one you like and I'll tell you the price. They come in all shapes and sizes. You like that one, Sidney? Clear and as flat as the finest in Germany. You won't find anything like it in all of Rome. Look at this work. Maestro, how much is this small mirror? I'd like to buy this. You're not being paid to sell mirrors or to turn my workshop into a marketplace. I'll do as I please. You have no authority over me. You have a half hour before I throw you out. Oh, you threaten me, do you? I'll show that old fool. Get away. Look out. No. It's seven years bad luck to break a mirror. Wait, I'll show this sorcerer. This alchemist who wants mirrors curved along the back for his own evil reasons. Why the secrecy? Why is he afraid? What's he making up there anyhow? Something to do with the black arts? Something to do with the black arts. You may as well go, Fenfire. It's all right. It was during this period that Leonardo returned to his study of anatomy with the same fervor he had shown years ago in Milan. Only this time, he attempted to discover the very reason for life itself. He wrote, The spirit is a power added to the body, because alone the body cannot endure. And further, The spirit desires to remain with the body, because without the organs of the flesh, it can see or hear nothing of this world. Maestro? Very sorry, Maestro, but I have orders that you are no longer to be allowed to visit the mortuary. But I've always been given permission. No longer. This is an order from the Superintendent General. But he said it was at your order. No, Maestro, this order is from a higher power. Such as the Cardinal? No, not the Cardinal. Much higher. There's been an accusation that you've been practicing sorcery and black magic. It was made by one of your German workmen. His Holiness is not a man who'd believe this. But he has commanded that you put a stop to this violation. But there are only studies. His Holiness commands that you put a stop to this. Leonardo wrote his patron, Giuliano de' Medici. I must ask you not to believe this malicious German who wants to steal the plans for my project so he can take them to his own country. This I will not allow him to do. 
nor will I let him fill my workshop with mirrors to sell at markets and fairs. Because of my opposition to his schemes, he has initiated slander against me, calling me a sorcerer, alchemist, and dealer in the black arts. Above all, his lies have lately prevented me from continuing my studies of anatomy. I am now barred from the hospital, and my research has been prohibited by the authorities. It is almost heartbreaking to realize how much of Leonardo's valuable time may have been wasted fighting these slanderous charges. It is especially tragic when one speculates on what his secret project may have been. Considering all we know about his lengthy research in Rome on concave mirrors and on chromatic aberration, historians surmise that he was working on a huge reflector telescope similar to the one developed 400 years later for the Mount Palomar Observatory. the comfort of a home, the silent affection of a family, and time to sit and quietly reconsider the past. But he had no home. It had never existed. As a boy, he lived in the workshop of his teacher, Verrocchio. What should have been his home was always filled with the many wives and children of his father, Ser Piero. Since that time, he had wandered from place to place finally reaching this city which he did not love and which held no love for him. At the papal court, Leonardo was isolated. Although he was treated with respect, there was an underlying feeling at court of uneasiness and fear. Fear of this old man who carried out secret studies in the privacy of his workshop and who was known to spend the dark hours of the night in the company of the dead. Maestro? Yet there was affection. I strew it's late. His one comfort was the enduring friendship of Francesco Melzi. And Salai? Uh, asleep in his room. Lorenzo locked up the door to the workshop. Yes, I think so. Uh, and the front door. I'll see to it. Uh, let the small door stay open so Sale is able to get inside when he returns. Should he return? The noisy and colorful atmosphere of Rome was well suited to Sale. The boy who stole money before he was 10 was now a man of 35. Despite Leonardo's years of patience with him, Salai was at best a mediocre painter, undoubtedly unhappy and discontented with his empty, unfulfilled life. He must have felt some guilt too, having wasted the marvelous gift which had been given to him, the friendship and affection of one of the greatest minds of his time. What are you doing up? When I heard you come in, I came down to lock the door. Are you all right? What's this supposed to be? What does it look like? I don't know exactly. You can explain it to me. Does it mean anything? What is there to explain? But what is he doing there? I mean, what is his hand pointing up to?
I know he told you. He would tell you. Uh, can you find the way to your room? Yes, yes. I'm not that drunk. Poor Salai. Soon he would leave Leonardo and devote the rest of his short life to complete dissipation. A few years after the death of Leonardo, he was killed, shot by an unknown assailant. In 1515, Francis I, at the age of 20, succeeded to the throne of France. Learned, intelligent, and courageous, he followed in the wake of his father, Louis XII, and invaded Italy. In the fall of that year, he fought and defeated the Milanese at Melignano. The battle lasted two days. 18,000 dead were left on the field. Francis I had forced his way into Italy, and the precarious balance between the small states was once again threatened. Something had to be done at once. So the Medici Pope, Leo X, hastened to Bologna. He was accompanied by all the artists and famous men he could gather, who would add luster to his court. Precious possessions on display for the foreign invader. Among them, the aging Leonardo. decisions without him. Decisions that might endanger the material wealth of the church or his position as supreme pontiff. rejoices in meeting you. But more than that, I'd be honored to have you live in France. From 1516 then, Leonardo did live in France, in the Chateau du Clue at Amboise. Francesco Melzi went along with him as his only companion. Salai finally had abandoned Leonardo. The young man died homeless and unhappy in Rome. Francis brought the maestro here and granted his new artist a princely pension, but he made him feel like a guest not like a dependent. Ah. <laughs> Some years later, Benvenuto Cellini wrote this. In the presence of the Cardinal and in my own hearing, the King said the artist Leonardo knew more than any other man on earth, not only of sculpture, painting, and architecture, but also of philosophy. His last days were spent in this serene refuge, provided by a generous king who asked nothing of him in return. All his life, Leonardo's studies and research had been based on things that were real, tangible. He looked upon religious beliefs with extreme skepticism. No human study can be called science unless mathematical proof is possible. In addition, there had always been a deeply rooted reverence for nature. But now, in the twilight of his years, he developed some new thoughts. Since no intellect can penetrate nature and no language can explain its marvels, human thought is guided to the contemplation of the divine. June 24th, 15. 
18, the feast day of St. John, Chateau de Clue at Amboise. He knew the end was near. His mind was filled with melancholy reflections. And yet he seemed content when he wrote, A life well spent is long. And again, As a day well spent makes for a sound sleep, so a life well spent brings a happy death. This earth, it's all so perfect, it's all so perfectly designed. It's impossible that a single mind didn't create it, that there's no plan to it. <laughs> now come, let's go inside. Now here, are some mechanical drawings, and those are notes on water. I always meant to write a dissertation on water, but I never quite found the time. Now oh, these are a, a collection of drawings on flight. Flight? Uh, I tried to construct a flying machine. It doesn't matter now. Ah, but look here. These are drawings on anatomy. Most of these I did in Milan, some in Florence. Leonardo's right hand had become paralyzed early in 1517. A few were done in Rome. In October of that same year, the Cardinal of Aragon came to see his workshop. Uh, though they're out of order, are my notes for a book I'm planning to write on uh, painting and perspective. Some important details of Leonardo's last years have come down to us through the writings of the Cardinal Secretary, Antonio de Beatis. Antonio! Never. His Grace the Cardinal of Aragon went to visit Maestro Leonardo da Vinci at Clue. The Maestro showed us his notes and books, and three paintings. They were perfect, as his eminence remarked. So perfect, I remember one standing before the frescoes of Piero del Francesca. It's magnificent. They were. There was no cross before, These are but so there is now. Perfect. Incredibly so. In the corridor. Materina. On the maestro's table. Giovanni. Light the lamp in my room. words a man learns in his life, proclaims the knowledge he has accumulated, and that is his real wealth. And when a man dies, all that which is stored in his brain also dies and ceases to be. At one moment we are alive, and the next moment a body. No more than that. Nothing remains. No, you're wrong. What about all this? All your work, your paintings, your studies? <laughs> They're worthless, Francesco. Miserable things. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing remains. No, Maestro. The memory that others have of us, that won't die. That'll still be here. 
That will remain. I know it will. You could be right. There's that at least. Good night, Francesco. Go to bed now. Don't stay up late. The lamp ruins the eyes. On May 2nd, 1519, Leonardo died. He was buried in France. Francesco Melzi, who was named executor of the will, sent a letter to Florence. Sir Giuliano da Vinci, my condolences. I know that this tragic event, the passing of your brother Leonardo, fills you with sorrow. The maestro and I were only companions. My own emotions cannot possibly hope to match your deep grief and that of your brother's. But as long as there is breath in my body, I shall cherish the great happiness and the deep pleasure of all those joyous moments we have shared together. I mourn his passing, mainly because I remember the great love he showed to a poor student. Yet all should grieve that it's beyond nature's feeble power to create another man like Leonardo da Vinci, for our loss is also the world's. Leonardo was dead. But fate had not quite finished with him yet. Francesco, who'd been left his estate, took all his many notes back to Milan to guard. But when he died, the precious notes began to be scattered. Between careless heirs and the workings of time, many were lost forever. Even Leonardo's final resting place was desecrated. Ten years after he was buried at the Church of St. Florentine, the building was devastated by the Huguenots during the religious war that swept France. Later, during the French Revolution, the lead linings of the surviving coffins were melted down for bullets, and the bones were thrown into a common grave. In a grave like this, mixed with many others, are the bones of Leonardo. As for his contributions to the world, so many continue to be ignored and unrecognized for centuries by those who came after him. But today, we know them as the prophetic discoveries of a man who, perhaps more than any other, probed deeply into nature and learned her most closely guarded secrets. No, wait here. I'll be back in a moment. His first stop was the monastery of Santa Maria della Grazia. Although the French regent was waiting to receive him, his only thought was the cold, clammy refectory where he had spent so many hours and the silent mark he had left of his presence. Imagine all that time. They closed off the room just so that could be painted. Now these students come here trying to copy that thing. They think we're running a school. I say this room is a place to eat. You go to school elsewhere. It's foolishness. That picture's a disaster. It's brought us nothing but a lot of trouble. I told them to cut a hole in it and make a door right to the kitchen. Now, there's a lover of great art. Cut a hole and make a door. Yes, a door, because in the winter, the food comes in half cold. And the prior says, be patient. Have we met? <laughs> Julio, isn't that the maestro himself? What happened at Santa Maria della Grazia also took place in the church of San Francesco Grande, where other students collected around his Virgin of the Rocks. Never before had paintings been so carefully studied and copied. During his absence, the two works Leonardo had left behind had become the very essence of painting. Maestro.
the maestro. Upon his arrival in Milan, he was to discover that the French, once his enemies, regarded him as a master artist, whereas back in Florence, he was in debt to Pierre Soderini for a painting he would never finish. The French regent of Milan was eager to return the duchy to the golden age of art it had once known under Lodovico the Moor, and to him, that meant only one thing, the permanent return of Leonardo. Maestro Leonardo. June of 1506, after an absence of six years, Leonardo returned to Milan. Once forced to flee from the advancing French army, he had left behind 20 years of development, triumph, and failure. Now he was curious to see how much of himself and of his past remained. Shall we come with you, maestro? No, you're taking too many liberties now. Who said you could sit on the table? Go on, get off, get off, get away. Father Agostino, could you help me? Watch over that table. It's almost impossible to 